I'm Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dare to Dream. Be inspired to live big and bold and take action to turn your dreams into your reality. Go beyond obstacles and limits of your thinking. Accelerate results to catapult yourself to success. I'm a visibility expert who gives media makeovers to clients, booking them on media interviews and turning their books into international bestsellers with guaranteed results. Join me at DebbieDashinger.com. Dare to do great things. Dare to shine. It's all about you becoming a visionary and leading the path. Welcome to your daring new life. Learn at your desk teleseminars. Desire to fix your finances? Become a best selling author? Execute your goals full circle from dream to done? Learn how to be interviewed on the radio for your business? Expert Debbie Dashinger teaches worldwide teleclasses. Her teleseminars receive rave reviews. Sign up for the teleclasses or receive the downloadable audios. Go to DebbieDashinger.com for your audio class now. Hey everybody, this is Dr. Dane here, and I would like to invite you to an adventure in being. I've just written and finished a new book known as Being You, Changing the World. Are you one of those dreamers? One of those people who's always known that other possibilities should be available but haven't yet been able to see them be created? Well, I wrote this book for you. In it, you'll find tools, processes, and unique perspectives to change the things you've always wanted to change but didn't know how. In it, you'll find an invitation to a different possibility for a way that we can be in this world that changes not only our lives, but by being us, allows us to contribute to changing everything planet-wide that doesn't work. Are you aware that truly great people, truly being them, is the only thing that has ever created a great change on this planet? Are you willing to step up? Are you willing to be one? Check out a copy of my new book, Being You, Changing the World. I invite you to go to beingyoubook.com for a free gift. Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. Enjoy my sexy voice. I'm wondering myself when this is going to be fully healed, but I have been speaking. I spoke at the Holistic Chamber. I don't even know if you guys know there is such a thing all across the United States and around the world. Holistic Chambers. And yeah, they're, you know, our people, our tribe. It's very cool. So I've spoken there. They were very kind when I apologized for my voice and not having a lot of power. And they all said, it's okay. You sound really sexy. I'll take it. You know, we're going to have a really interesting show today because we're exploring the subject of being a psychic medium. And we're going to have a guest here. She's pretty incredible. Karen Reese. And the interview will be a little bit later. Rob Rowe is here with us. He was the one who was live covering that interview with Karen. So Rob, a warm welcome and thanks for being here. Oh, my pleasure, Debbie. Always. How are you? I'm doing good besides the husky voice, the husky sexy voice. And I I guess I want to start before I tell people a little bit about her bio. But since you spent time with her, what was it like? What was your experience of Karen like? Well, Karen is a fascinating person. And, and keep in mind, my perspective here going into this thing was as a man of science. I'm a data kind of guy. You know, I'm not a woo-woo kind of guy at all. You know, I generally don't believe in a lot of stuff that there's not evidence for. Not to say I don't believe in what I don't see. I know that there are a lot of interesting forms of energy out there that uh, are unknown and still being studied. And uh, I've got an open mind. But I came into this interview with a healthy degree of skepticism. And when this interview concluded, I was completely convinced that Karen Reese is the real thing. A fascinating individual, uh, very, very warm, and uh, just an absolute pleasure to talk with. And uh, very much by the numbers also. You know, she, you know, has a lot of uh, evidence for what she does. She is hired by law enforcement. Uh, She is hired by uh, people who are looking for uh, lost loved ones, 
people who are looking for lost things. So she does a lot of you know professional work with the gifts that she has. She does uh, financial work. Uh, she has gifts of being able to see how uh, financial instruments uh, might behave in the next uh, time periods, days, weeks, months, and make financial decisions based on those psychic intuitions that she has. And she does that successfully. So uh, like I said, I'm all about the science, all about the numbers, and she has the the science and the data to back up what she does, and she's also got some fascinating aspects to her work that are much more on a metaphysical level as well. All right. Well, let's tell everybody a little about her so they understand. Gifted since birth, Karen Reese has given detailed psychic readings and consultations to over 10,000 individuals to date, including law enforcement, business professionals, film stars, and a wide variety of artists and filmmakers. Karen is a seasoned television and film speaker and guest and has been viewed on TLC, A&E, CW, Discovery, Lifetime, and Biography channels, Leah Ramini, and many other media outlets. In addition, She's worked with industry leaders such as psychic medium James Van Prague, who has been on this show, Nick Redfern, Josh Warren, and Ruben Uriate. Karen has also appeared on many radio shows, including this one, and in print. And she shows a diversity of unique psychic skills unmatched in her field. So, yeah, a lot of things that you talked about, I think you gave a pretty good detailed of solving cold cases for law enforcement, skilled psychic historian who provides professionals with detailed information. I think that's amazing on historical places and objects. And she's also, as if she's not well-rounded enough, she's a published author, a gifted artist, a former stockbroker, and has a BS degree in business, S-U-N-Y being from New York, I totally get it. Sunny, she's also listed in Marquis Who's Who. So very cool. She's known in the industry with an accuracy rate of 98%. And by the way, the average psychic medium has only a 58, excuse me, a 50% accuracy rate while Karen comes in at 98%. So it's pretty powerful. I want to skip to the fact that after your interview, which we're going to hear very shortly, you had an experience that you were completely not prepared for with Karen. And most unfortunately for you, not for us, but for your own private collection, you did not tape it. But why don't you tell us what happened once the cameras, once the recording was turned off and you were there with Karen in the press media room? Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty interesting how everything played out. Uh, she had actually uh, missed her first appointment. I guess she had uh, you know something had happened, and we were booking the room for a half hour only, which was actually a very lucky thing to have happened. So we ended up getting back together as the last appointment for the media room for the day, which meant we had the as much time as we wanted to sit there and chat, and and we really kind of bonded. You know, when by the time we were we were done with the basic podcast. I was kind of feeling like we were pretty good friends. I guess she felt that way as well. So she wasn't in any hurry to leave. So she sat there and uh, we just kind of started chatting about all kinds of stuff for a while. And then uh, she said something to me about, uh, oh, by the way, you, you do know your mom's here, right? And I go, well, no, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, she said, your, your, your mom wanted to say hello. And uh, she's here in the room with us now. And my mom had passed in uh, 2009. And I thought, well, you know, that's great. And I had had a, another experience with uh, a friend of ours uh, named uh, Julie Lowenstein a few weeks ago, a few weeks before the Conscious Life Expo. And a similar thing had happened. And uh, Julie's a very gifted psychic as well. And uh, I did have the opportunity at that time to communicate with my mom a little bit from beyond the uh, uh, <laughs> the veil, so to speak, for lack of a better term. And uh, 
while we were chatting there in the room, uh, Karen was, you know, translating for me as an interpreter between uh, this realm and the next. Uh, so I actually got to converse with my mom a little bit, which was was really cool. And uh, she was saying things that sounded like my mom, and that was kind of the interesting part of it. So I didn't really have any sense that you know Karen was making stuff up because it sounded like things my mom would have actually said, which was extremely interesting. And then uh, Karen had said something about, okay, uh, I'm, I'm getting somebody else here. Uh, is, is there a, a David in your life or in your wow. family? And uh, David is the name of my brother who passed when he was 14 and I was 16. And she had uh, said to me, well, you know, your, your mom and your brother are, are both here. And uh, they, they send their love. And they, uh, they both say they're very proud of you. And you know, they, they wish you well from the other side of the veil, which was, uh, was pretty cool. And then uh, that was really not the end of it. Well, then we, we chatted a little more. I got to actually uh, converse with my brother a little bit as well. And then uh, she had something. Uh, uh, she said something about, like, "Okay, I'm I'm getting somebody else here. Uh, who who's Bob?" And I I said, "Well, well, uh, Bob was the name of my dad." And she said, "Oh, you know, since the other you know family members are here, you know, Bob's making an appearance as well." And uh, she had mentioned like. I had to, you know, a couple people following me around in my hotel early, early today is what she was saying. And uh, I didn't know who they were. There was uh, this David and this Bob. So I guess they, they knew that I was going to be meeting with you. And they wanted to, you know, make sure that, you know, we all got a chance to converse and say hello. So I, I thought that was really interesting. And I had never mentioned the name David. I have never mentioned the name Bob. And then if, as if that's not enough, it got even more interesting and she's saying, okay, I'm getting somebody else here. Is, is there a friend of your mom or is there you know, somebody else here that, that's been you know, part of your life named Jean? And indeed, Jean was the name of my mom's sister, a couple of years older. And she had passed, I think it was in 03, 04, something like that. So uh, Jean got to say hi to me as well and I to her through Karen as an uh, interpreter. And uh, it was, you know, quite, quite an emotional experience, you know, getting to actually, you know, chat with my dead family. And my, my dad had passed away in 2005. And my dad was always a fan of kind of uh, goofy type jokes. He was always, you know, kind of joking around with people. And uh, sometimes, much to my embar- embarrassment, his joking was really goofy and kind of silly and I would kind of the eye rolling variety of humor uh, rather than, than other other types of humor and indeed he had said a couple comments through Karen that made me feel like it was really my dad you know it was you know it was eye rolling uh, comments I, uh, yeah eye rolling kind of humorous co- comments of you know sometimes more <laughs> eye rolling than ac- actually funny but it's you know some, you know Got to give him credit. He, he did have some funny <laughs> stuff too, but you know, you know, there was a fair bit of eye rolling at the, at the same time. So uh, that was a very, very convincing experience. And uh, have you, you ever had anything like that? You know, where you you felt like you were in, in contact with uh, you know somebody who passed away, a relative perhaps, Deb? Well, I would say that I have had that experience. Unfortunately, not with Karen, because that actually sounds really extraordinary and powerful. I did, however, have a guest on the show recently, and I flat out asked because it just never came up. And I always thought that's so interesting. And, oh, God, there's no one on the other side for me kind of thing. And she said, well, actually, and right before she said it, very interesting because you and I just had a conversation about premonition and precog. And as it turns out, I had that feeling like, oh, I really hope it's my grandmother I don't know why, because I was very close to both my grandmother and grandfather, but grandmother came up strongly. Well, actually, here's the truth. I think I've wanted to connect with my grandmother as past because since you and I have been together, there are pieces that I felt were potentially signs. For instance, you are in real estate. My grandmother is in real estate. You're both born on July 26th. There was just these these parallels. So I had that wish in my heart, and there you go. I start getting a reading from my grandmother. And exactly like you're saying, the well, for me, it was the facts that 
my grandmother was saying through this psychic medium to me was uncanny. Really, there was no way somebody could know like specifics about a pearl necklace, about exactly what's happening right now with my mother's health, the kind of character qualities my mother has, uh, why my specifically my grandmother's proud of me. My grandmother did mention you. And um, so I had that wonderful feeling. I could really relax and enjoy and receive what I was hearing and feel quite connected with my grandmother. Excellent. The way these kind of things manifest can, can be pretty interesting. I, I was extremely fortunate to have this you know, experience uh, with uh, Karen that was quite convincing and also uh, with Julie a few uh, weeks before that. But uh, I've also had experiences in dreams that uh, were pretty supportive of this whole idea of communicating with those who have passed. And it, it really leads to a lot bigger questions. Uh, with, with my brother, for instance, it was about three weeks after his death in, uh, I think it was probably about uh, 1972, 73, something like that, when he had died. And uh, about three weeks after his death, I had uh, found myself in a dream, although it was a very vivid dream, sitting in the living room of the house we were living in at the time. It was a multi-level house. We were downstairs uh, sitting in two chairs at uh, 45 degree angles from each other. You and, and your brother. Me and my and brother. And I remember the, you know, very clearly the exact chairs we were sitting in. There was a blue chair and a green chair, and I was sitting in one. He was sitting in the other. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we were just, uh, I f found myself kind of right in the midst of a conversation that, you know, two people might just be having, you know, normally. And... Uh, I said it's up to the effect, uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase some of this, but I'll try to relay the conversation just you know, because I think it was you know, quite an interesting conversation. And I said it's up to me the effect of, uh, oh, wow, so it's, uh, it's nice to see you again. How, how are things where you're at? And he said uh, something to the effect of, you know, things are good. You know, I didn't uh, want you to worry about uh, you know, what's going on on this side of the, I'll use the term the veil again for lack of a better term. And uh, I, I had asked, are you uh, still playing music there? And he was a, a fantastic piano player in addition to uh, a couple other instruments as well. Also played some clarinet, some oboe, but uh, extremely gifted musician. So that was you know, one of the first things I had uh, was I had some curiosity about was, was he able you know, to carry on with the musical study on the other side of the veil? And he said that, yeah, indeed, he was. And uh, I thought that was pretty cool. So uh, I then asked, uh, well, will we be able to stay in touch on a regular basis in, in this kind of a, a format here? And he said, uh, probably not, because there is a great deal of energy expenditure required to visit from one realm to the next. So uh, for some reason, it was not really practical for him to make that transition over, you know, to visit me in my dreams on any kind of a regular basis. And uh, I said, well, okay, so I guess that's, that is what it is. So I said, uh, you know, will I, will I be seeing you again? And he said, most definitely. And uh, it was kind of like, okay, well, well, carry on. And I just wanted to, you know, pop in, let you know what was going on, just uh, give you a status update, so to speak. And uh, that was pretty much that. And you know, it was, you know, the end of the little dream. It didn't last horribly long, maybe you know, three, four, five minutes, something like that. Well, at least on this, on this plane, maybe yeah. not in the dream plane. Uh -oh. Well, I have a question for you because this is actually not unique mm -hmm. for you to have dreams like this. I don't know that you have psychic phenomenon ha happen in your waking life, but you do have extraordinary dreams. Do you think, honestly, do you think that you have some psychic ability that happens in your particular dream state? I don't know. Maybe, maybe in the sense of some uh, potential, um, I would like to pursue it. 
uh, I know uh, Karen offers some classes. I know there there are some other people in her field of study. Each person in this field tends to have a certain specialty. It seems like you know Karen's uh, specialty is uh, maybe the psychic history part, maybe going back into the past, examining things. Obviously, the mediumship is huge for her. She has uh, you know tremendous gifts there as far as helping uh, people communicate you know realm to realm. And uh, you know, whereas some other people in this space might have some other abilities more in the realm of you know of seeing the future, uh, precognition, that sort of well, thing. Well, let me ask you this because I'm going to go back to the question. You're you're evading me a little bit, but I I'm very earnest when I say that because I've heard your dreams and I think there's something there. I can tell you, I don't have dreams like that, and you remember them in a way that I think is also special. So I'm going to put you on the spot because yesterday you shared with myself and a friend, G.P. Walsh, this dream, and we were both so taken with it. So something happened yesterday. We were at an expo, right? Mm -hmm. And somebody said something, one of the speakers said something, and you suddenly had this memory of a dream that you'd forgotten. Will you talk about the dream if you're comfortable to? Yeah, well, uh, let me give a uh, uh, hats off to uh, Brad and Casey. So that last Brad name? Brad and Casey Wallace, who channeled Julius. Yeah, yeah, f- phenomenal people. Yeah. Yeah, it was actually the first time I'd met them. So, uh, yeah, I felt very fortunate to, to make their acquaintance. So I felt like kind of, you know, bonded with them right away. So I got uh, into just a bit of a conversation with, uh, with Casey, and uh, she had gone into channeling mode. So I was actually talking to uh, Julius, who uh, is a name they use for a group of uh, disembodied entities who have once been human. And they do, you know, a fair bit of, of teaching and sharing uh, information that is And just a channeled. PS for anyone who's finding this interesting and wants a reference point. Brad and Casey Wallace have been interviewed on the show, so you can get... It's an extraordinary show with Julia, so be sure to search on my website or wherever you're listening to the podcast or watching this on YouTube, and you can definitely check in and get some wisdom from Julius. Yeah, well... I just wanted to like lay the groundwork for you know a way to answer your question. So in the conversation with uh, Karen, a lot of ground was covered, but we talked about the importance of remembering. And uh, that can mean a lot of different things. It can be remembering you know past lifetimes. It can be remembering dreams and signs that we've had uh, that could could be forms of communication. It can be you know remembering maybe things from other realms, other other Just dimensions. Just so I'm clear, because you said in your conversation with Karen, you talked about remembering. You mean Karen Reese, not Julius? No, I'm talking about Julius. Ah, okay. So, so let's in the conversation correct that. with Julius. So the. What that did is it triggered a remembrance of a dream I'd had, oh, maybe late 80s. And uh, I, I don't really know what to make of this dream, but it was quite interesting. And uh, it had to do with uh, floating in a rowboat on the River Styx uh, in some sort of a cave. I know there was a kind of a rock uh, you know, ceiling. It wasn't the open sky at all, rather dark. And uh, I was in this rowboat, and there was another being there, but he was not actually in the rowboat. He was a vampire, and uh, he had one foot resting on the edge of the rowboat, but other than that, he was basically sitting in air as if he was uh, weightless. And uh, I had noticed a, a scrap of parchment in the bottom of the rowboat, and uh, see if I can remember this. There's a little poem on it, and it was about uh, remembering. It uh, said something to the effect of, Remember who can set you free. Remember who is with it, without you. Remember who can hold a key. Remember who will doubt you. And each of those lines I found quite interesting because they can, can be analyzed and, you know, kind of picked apart each word for, uh, you know, different types of, of meanings. So... I have no idea what it was all about. You know, I have no idea where it came from. Uh, but I was reading an Anne Rice book around that <laughs> that time. So thus pr- the vampire. Thus, thus the vampire. That's great. Although the, the name Insanto, I don't know uh, where it came from. Other, it has a phonetic uh, similarity to the word insouciance. Uh, so take that for for what it is. But. Uh, 
Yeah, dreams uh, have have always been you know very interesting part of my world, and uh, I, I'm noticing some very interesting connections. I will men- mention one other thing about uh, relationships with the living and the dead. I was with my father at the time he died. He was in a uh, hospital room up in his hometown of Bishop, California. And uh, his breathing was getting about ragged. I knew he was probably going to pass within a few minutes. So I had called upon my brother to maybe show up to sort of, you know, help the transition. And you uh, mean your brother who had passed. My right? brother who had passed. And I figured, well, if there was uh, any time for him to make another appearance, and he, since he really hadn't made an appearance since that dream three weeks after his death, I figured, you know, this might be a good time. And you know, as soon as I said that, you know, I felt kind of a, you know, my hair stand up on my neck and that sort of thing. And, you know, felt a very interesting presence in the room. And shortly after that, my father passed. And I didn't really, you know, have anything to make of it after that. I kind of figured he probably did show up, uh, you know, if, if one can even believe in those things, which I kind of did. Uh, but when I asked uh, Karen about that, when in our post podcast conversation, he said, uh, she said, absolutely. And uh, your father is uh, very grateful that he, uh, he did show up and that you did request for him to show up because it definitely eased his transition. Mm-hmm. Uh, because as, as we've all seen in movies about the afterlife, sometimes uh, you know, the transition from life to death can be somewhat jarring. And sometimes the, the soul doesn't know where he is. They can get confused and that sort of thing. So the very fact that uh, my brother had showed up there at the time of my father's transition uh, definitely uh, you know, smoothed the process, so to speak. So I found just kind of an interesting tie-in between all of those different things. I have to say something that's going to come out in the interview that everyone's going to hear in just a minute that I find fascinating, and I'm not sure this is so for everybody, and I know I'm really speaking your praises here, but I really do find this fascinating, and that is that when you received, in fact, your first reading from a psychic medium and she connected you with your mother and brother and really deeply your mother and you had and they'll they'll hear about it in a minute in the interview but you have this very uh you have a dialogue that goes back and forth where you say i'm sorry if i wasn't a great son at some times and your mother uh says back "Mm, please i'm the one who's sorry and here's why so you have quite a an experience Here's where this is going. Why I think it's notable is that you actually had a complete healing. You walked away from that experience and said, I will never replay these conversations with my mother again, have these resentments, feel unfinished. You were done. The story was over. And the fact that she comes, your mom and your brother come back and your father, when you're speaking to Karen is lovely. I think it's gravy at this point, but I just want to point it out because I'm not sure I've ever considered it personally in the past. And I don't know that I've ever quite heard another story. And if someone out there has had something similar, I'd love you to write in and tell us about it because I think to connect with a psychic medium who connects you to the other side and you can communicate at that level and be done. No more anger, fear, resentment, pain. That is profound. Yeah, it really was. So I'm uh, I'm very grateful to those people who helped uh, facilitate the whole thing. To uh, Julie Lowenstein and uh, Karen Reese. Karen, you're awesome. Hope we get to meet again sometime soon. Well, enjoy the show and the interview. This is Debbie Dashinger and Rob. And here's the interview with Rob and Karen Reese. Enjoy. And we are live. This is Rob Rowe standing in for Debbie Dashinger of the Dare to Dream podcast. And I have the wonderfully good fortune to be here with Karen Reese. Karen, thanks for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. When you say live, are you mean live with the dead? It's kind of an oxymoron. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but the dead never uh, stiff yeah, you, just yeah, say okay, it. Okay, okay. <laughs> Never a dull moment with Karen. So, so uh, 
just let's I want to you know, just jump into you know a lot of stuff that's just on my mind but but just for our, our, our listeners let's get the high level overview what what, what have you been doing? How did you start out, and how, how did we, you drop into your present field of work? Well, you know what? Actually, I was born this way. Uh, I'm a psychic and a medium, so I see past, present, and future and speak to the dead. But along the way, it's first of all, I should back it up. It's on my mom's side, so her side tend to have a lot of psychic mediums. Um, but along the way um, in my life, I um, have done many things. I've worked as a stockbroker, which I do a lot with clients with uh, businesses and what have you, so I do a lot of business-related activities. Talk more about that later. I sure. love those tech stocks, just saying, <laughs> you know. So, But I, I was seven years old when I predicted my dad's death. And then I, um, three weeks later, he dropped out of a stroke unexpectedly, both my brother and myself. And that's when we realized, you know, we were really psychics. Along the way, you know, my mom would say things. Oh, I saw three monks. There's a plane crash. And as kids, we would see things, you know, at four or five and six, we'd go shopping and see dead people. Or I would know things ahead of time. But I thought it was normal. So it didn't freak you out? You, you, they were just like you know other people you would see, you know, yeah. kind of kind of like in the in the movie. Oh yeah, I was just oh, like okay. yeah, whatever, you know, okay. it is what it is. Although it does create you know awkward teenage moments, you know, but that's a whole other story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like when the heart throbs, father just dies, and you're in eighth grade class, and suddenly you get called on, and you mention that Paul's father had died, and you're like, oops, because he was standing there talking to me. So, how was it that you got into these these other careers? Did you kind of push your gifts sort of to the background, kind of back burner it for a while, while you you know just pursued you know some other uh, business more 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 mainstream interests? Well, shall we you say? know, that's a good question because there's a lot of people in my family that have this uh, ability, and I tell people, you know, everybody has a little bit of ability. Everybody can draw a stick figure. Not everybody's a Da Vinci, and. Um, but it just was something that I, you know, school is very important to me. I thought about being a plastic surgeon. I was smart in science. I was also artistically gifted, so I could draw portraits. I do some of that in my, my uh, readings occasionally. So that's how I ended up going down that road. And within my first year of college, I realized, you know, that I couldn't take really smelly smells in lab laboratory classes at 7. And I saw an advertisement to be a stockbroker, so I went down, took the test, and then got into that. Learned a lot about business. It was a great um, opportunity. Oh, that. Yep, great cold calling. Loved it, B2B. You know, most people don't like it. I loved it. I thrived in it. So it was a lot of fun. It was engaging. And uh, I knew I would do this eventually full-time. I thought, oh, yeah, when I'm 60, I'll do it. But it's funny. The universe just pushes you. And so I did that for a number of years, probably five, six years, you know, a lot of sales and what have you. And then eventually rolled into my business full-time, my practice. Well, I like those kind of jobs. That's what I do now. I, I'm in the a real estate finance business. I so knew that. That's why I thought we'd bond over that. I had so, a feeling. Yeah. Similar kind of thing. And I enjoy it. I, you know, the, the people I connect in with are mostly on LinkedIn. So I see a little bit about what they're about. So we can usually pick, you know, one or two points to build some rapport on or something like that. And it's all about making new friends. It kind of seems like to me, you know, and it's it's never annoying, even if somebody is – you know, not in the mood for the conversation or what we have. There's, the, hey, thanks anyway, man. I can't talk to you, you know, right now, but I appreciate the call. You know, it's all very nice. And then the people that are into it, you know, it's a fun conversation. And if you can help people build their wealth, then that's cool. Well, and I think right? people mistake, you know, salespeople as, I mean, there's good and bad, but we're problem solvers. At least mm-hmm. when I worked in sales and I have a business now in my practice, but like you, you're a problem solver. Totally. And we do great things to get people to the next level. You know, so we work our magic. Well, it, it almost, I'm guessing here, it's probably a, a little bit of a problem solver situation in your work with the those who have passed uh, because there are probably so many unresolved relationship issues, yes. I would think. Totally. And I had an experience with a psychic just a, a few weeks ago, uh, a wonder, wonder, wonderful friend of uh, uh, Debbie's named Julie, and uh, we did about a two and a half hour session something like that and we got into a lot of stuff with my mom my mom was a wonderful woman great mother really meant well but she was tumultuous to deal with in in many ways and oftentimes i would find myself you know reliving conversations thinking i wish i would have said something differently maybe i said something to her that was a little hurtful or you know i i was a very good son most of the time, and she was a very good mom vast majority of the time, but we had our, our friction here and there. And when I was with Julie, she said, well, you know, your mom's here. Is there anything you want to tell her? I said, you know, tell, tell her, you know, I'm sorry if I, I was ever, you know, not the best possible son. And she goes, no, don't even think about it. She's saying, you know, she's the one who's sorry, and, uh, you, you know, she... she 
she really loves you and she really wants the best for you and uh, you know she she wants to just dissipate any of any of the, this friction I swear to God never since then have I ever thought uh, a discordant thought about my mom so it really turned things around I, I think there's isn't there a huge potential for people to really have healing experiences like that oh it is in fact one time I um, this is many many years ago I was doing a group party and I'll never forget when I walked in there was a gentleman there and I said oh no you have to stay because on the way there I had this woman you know I'm um, related you know I'm uh, the gentleman I'm his sister whatever I knew nothing what was going on so I insisted I said I really do need to speak to you I know you're around all these women you need to come down and let's you know get down to business anyways I said your sister's here she was murdered Um, her husband's still in the living his name is Jimmy her name was Andrea or whatever the name was and she wants you to move forward and I went on and on with some other detailed information and I'll tell you afterwards he said to me you know this session was better than seeing a psychologist that I've been dealing with for 13 years because for 13 years he was trying to manage his emotions and try to move back you know move into the uh, better place but you know he finally had contact with the other side and I've seen the other side too I go out of body a lot I hit a near death so I tell people, God didn't want me, the devil didn't like me, but they sent me back here <laughs> to pay taxes. <laughs> Go figure. Well, that, that kind of brings us to another yes. fascinating subject to me. I am such a huge fan of ancient history. Anything to do with the Persians, Romans, oh. the Greeks, um, you, you know, anything that this fellow Robert Schock's talking about, you know, Egyptians, the Gobekli Tepians, Peruvians, all this kind of stuff. I think it's just incredibly interesting. Now, you had mentioned that you're a psychic historian, too. Mm-hmm. Do you, and, and this kind of gets to about what we were talking about a little bit earlier with uh, people like Julia Mossbridge, who have the ability to sort of transcend time, to sort of, you know, rise above, maybe you call it another dimension or something like that. I mean, physicists have talked for a long time about, you know, time being in, in some ways nonlinear or uh, different in some physical realms or, than it is as we perceive it on a day-to-day basis. Would, would you agree do you, there are there certain points where time is... is behaves quite differently than oh, in this realm? absolutely. In fact, in this realm, scientists have now proven that we are, we've sped up our time by two or three minutes. In the last year, I heard that by actual scientists. In this realm, but in other realms, yeah, time is just a whole different place. It's not linear. So sometimes you're at a standstill, sometimes it goes fast. It just depends on where you are. Even Einstein uh, theorized that time on the other side was different than it is here. You know, we're very linear. So interesting. Can you get into any more detail about how you would actually characterize it from the standpoint of of physics? Is there a way where we can actually transcend the earthly view of time and and maybe move to the future, move to the past? Once we get into the realm of precognition, that's toward the future. Oh, yeah. But you mentioned the psychic historian thing. And plus, you you mentioned work that you've done with law enforcement, going back and, you know, finding details about possible crime scenes, things like that. But just for my own curiosity, what about the Greeks or the Persians or the Romans? Can can you see what went on maybe at certain battles or something? Oh, yeah. I can go back in time, you know, and I could go forward. You can do it in a meditation or you can do it, you know, in your dream state or as a psychic. When I'm using my psychic, I'll go back in time and I'll see how people, you know, what they thought, how they felt, how they lived, an experience. When I do murder cases, I relive the experience of the murderer as well as the, the victim. So I can actually go in, and it's like, for me, I see like a television screen. So I really get immersed into that, which you can do, because, again, if you go into the uh, non-time space linear type of thing, if you go into the other side by meditation or out-of-body experiences, you can see how everything sort of fills in. Okay. Yeah. Have you ever worked with any of the guys that have, uh, have really popularized history in the podcast realm, you know, like maybe like Daniele Bellelli or uh, any, anybody like that, that to, may, to maybe fill in some gaps? Because a lot of these guys are always talking about, well, oh, this is what we know and this is what we don't know. We have to kind of speculate here and there, that sort of thing. Well, funny you should say that. I was doing a show for um, Discovery many, many years ago, and I, I received a package on Monday. I didn't open it up. And they said, we want you to take a look at it. Anyways, long story short, I kept getting this thing about Egypt and pyramids in Egypt. So when I grabbed this package, like three days later, I put my hand in, all of a sudden I felt sick to my stomach. And I pull it out, and there was sand in it. And I said, this is Egyptian sand. And as I pulled it out, I started getting pictures in my mind and how it related to um, the pyramids, the Sphinx, and so on and so forth. And looking below psychically, I mean, I could see things along... um, 
uh, buried beneath like the Sphinx and uh, things that have effects onto our, our life here, which I think one of the reasons why the Egyptians don't want to dig deeper is they don't want to ruin something that you know they, we may not be ready for. As far as working with other people, I haven't um, in that capacity, but in my own edification and my own way of doing things, I've worked on many different projects and see things. One thing that has been brought up, you know, from time to time, from uh, I, don't, I don't know if you've really mentioned it per se, but it, the role of ethics in things like financial dealings. Now, you mentioned you worked as a stockbroker. Now, it's almost like you know somebody who gets uh, a magic genie bottle, and the genie comes out and says, you know, what, I'll give you three wishes. He says, hey, I only need one. I, I want to know what the stock market's doing this time next month. Or I want to get a magical newspaper in my, my box that you know tells me the stock prices in, in advance. And you you would really only need one wish if you could really get that, and then then your tickets it's bought. Pretty, yeah, now, <laughs> exactly. Now, now, does ethics uh, play a role in the capabilities of of your ability? I mean, let's say you know you wanted to raise money to do something evil versus raising money to you know do something like you know Bill and Melinda Gates do or something like that. Would that affect your ability to actually perform that kind of psychic work, or are we just dealing with sciences and is it is it completely agnostic to the ethics involved? Um, well, I personally do follow my own ethics. Um, I use it to manage my own business. Um, I think if you have a gift, you can use it good or bad. You have the gift regardless. Um, but to me, like I was stating to, to people earlier, if I have a client, I don't want to see you for at least six months. When you have somebody that repeatedly says, come back and see me, then you know that's a challenge You know, as far as being a psychic medium. As far as applying it to, to the stock market, I mean, I always try to live by ethics and values because personally what goes around comes around. You know, that's my belief system. You know, And I don't think it can curtail or stop your abilities if you're doing something in a naughty way, but... Um, you know why do it in well, the first well, place? I mean, I, I think you know most. There's nothing bad about wanting to make a lot of money. I mean, you know, people can use it for anything they want. Uh, and assume, let's assume somebody's going to use it for a good thing. You know, to, just to live his life well and maybe do some philanthropy or something like that. Is it truly possible to apply psychic abilities to oh, the yeah. stock market? And uh, how, how does that work? Where would be an example? Do you look at the stock chart? Uh, Me personally, I know, mean, you probably you study the business model of the company. Yeah, you know, what would you do? Um, well, funny you should say that. Um, it, to me, money's an exchange of energy, like I'm sure you agree. And mm -hmm. what you put in is what you get out. So I don't look at it the way most people do. Everybody, you know, you get people that look at it one extreme or the other extreme. Um, when I'm doing work with clients, and I've done in one case when I worked with this FBI agent, I remember seeing psychically these, uh, was it T? TWO or TXO, I can't remember what the trade was. At the time, I was out of the market. I wasn't doing anything. And I said, you need to buy it. All I could tell you is within seven days, it's going to go up really high, and then it's going to go down. So you want to get in and get out. And that's exactly what it was. So I see it like a TV screen. Yeah. I don't sit down. I don't analyze the stocks or anything from that perspective. Um, although I can take a look and take a uh, so left you, brain look at So you look can kind it. of visually see the stock chart? As if yep, you were I, I get like a little looking at simple. E or something? Yeah, exactly. You <laughs> must be psychic. <laughs> I knew I liked you. But yeah, that's exactly what it is. I get like a little TV screen. So I'll see something psychically and I'll be like, oh, buy this stock or that stock. Now I know like in my own portfolio, I'll look at different things and say, oh, I like this or that. I like tech stocks, but I do that on the left brain side because I like what they stand for, how you, you know, that you know they're always going to be used. Google's a top platform, so... You know, you know that they're always going to be a well, you know, positioned stock. But as far as like psychically, I'll get things just like a little TV screen. And by the way, I've given out winning lottery numbers too. Really? A lot. I tell people if you're destined to get them. I, mean, I had a laugh one time. My mom called. She goes, "Oh, you know, Uncle Pat's going to Vegas. He wants to know." And I said, "Well, mom, you know, you're supposed to get it when you're supposed to get it." I don't see this, but I see five lottery numbers. And he lost in Vegas, but when he came back, he uh, played those five lottery numbers, and five out of the seven numbers he hit. I should have taken a commission though. But I yeah, didn't, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so. Like, wow. Anyone, nice chunk of change. But again, he was destined to, to, you know, get that. And he was a very um, giving person anyway. So if anybody deserved it, he deserved it. What What has happened lately that might be new on the scene for you? Uh, any particular thing that, you know, might not be in, in your material or your books or anything like that? Any, like, really new developments in the field? Um, well, I have the Karen Reese show. So we do that every week where we have an audience and usually about 80 people. And then we you know, throw that back out on television. I'll tell you, speaking about murder, and this is where I'm kind of relating this, I'll never forget, I was telling somebody this earlier, where prior to going on set or prior to, you know, my days when I have uh, clients, I'll get information, whether it's a dead person, whether it's just something past, present, or future. And I remember before I went on set and I said, we've got murders today. We've got murders. And, you know, I had 100 people, 
and I had five different people with five different murder connections, none of which were, that were related. I remember walking in and saying, you've got a murder, you've got a murder, there's one here, I have people all around me. It was crazy. And I thought, what are the odds of that when you look at the numbers, and your numbers, person like I am, but to have five different people out of 100 people unrelated with all different murder cases, and I had five different victims trying to connect with me. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I also did another, uh, I was a guest on Ghost Bait, which will be coming out pretty soon. And that's a great show, too, if anybody likes anything that's got a real interesting spin on the paranormal. Now, can you shut this off and on? Um, I get bleed throughs. So a lot of times I'll be driving, and I'll be like, oh, I'm picking up Uncle Charlie in the back seat, you know. Um, so, or I'll get stuff uh, about the future, and I just let it flow. Eventually, it'll you know make so a connection. It, it, it's been going on all your life, so you just kind of accept it as you know part and parcel as, of who you are, and doesn't really disturb you. Or, or did it ever? Uh, you, you mentioned earlier that you just thought it was just how everybody was, or something. Yeah, I thought it was, right? and you never wanted to tell your doctor your voice is in your head. I've said that before. Yeah. They might think you're schizo. Your voice yeah. isn't, yeah. But no, I just take it for what it is. Just like most people, you get thoughts. It's like, yeah, okay, whatever. You know, I mean, I've had instances where I've gone to bed at night. And I've had people, you know, touch me or pull the covers off my bed. Uh, all sorts of crazy things. So that's got to be a little annoying. Yeah, it's, it's like, like leave me alone. Yeah. I want to sleep. So go do the dishes. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But I don't really, you know, it doesn't really bother me. You know, I believe in God, so I'm not real worried about, you know, the other side. But I, I have had moments where they've harassed me. But there are times too, where, you know, people are just anxious. You're going to see my mother today, you know, or whatever. I've been in the shower before, and I've had visitors. Poor things. I feel sorry for them. <laughs> You know. Wow, so you got such a broad spectrum. And, uh, the other thing I, I was uh, thinking about is the uh, the past life uh, re- regression thing. Now, that can be just interesting and fun, and it could probably also be very therapeutic. So, yes. you know, I've I've had I think what are glimpses. Of, you know, I've kind of you know played around with you know some altered states in a very focused way, and I have what I think were some. You know, I, I don't think I think I have a, one of these guys that has a little bit of gift, but I don't have a ton. So I kind of, you know, always kind of waffle between, well, was that my imagination? I don't completely trust it. Whereas you, there's probably no doubt. You, you know, if you see something, you see it for sure. Now, wh- what are some examples of uh, you know some of the things as far as you know past lives where you've really you know been able to provide some concrete benefit for somebody in their in their life, other than just something that was maybe fun and entertaining. You know, that's a great question, and I'll tell you, I do past lives probably a little different than most people. I'll take somebody into, like, a meditative state, a light hypnotic state, and while they're going through it, before I say anything, I'm watching in my mind. I'm like, okay, see this person maybe as a Civil War uh, personal uh, person, rather, and then they'll say, I was a Civil War person. So I'm, like, ahead of the game. So for me, I can see ahead of the game and know where we're going to go. So if I see something detrimental, I can kind of, you know, prevent them from having a bad reaction. So in a case where I had somebody where they had lost an arm in this current life as a result of a motorcycle accident, I took them back into a place where their arm was actually cut off in a battle. Um, and it was very traumatic in both instances. And in this lifetime, as it turned out, that he was trying to heal that previous um, uh, experience of having lost his arm in a battle. So in this lifetime, he lost it in a motorcycle accident, but that was to relate to that past life. Oh, yeah. So it's pretty traumatic, that's a, that's yeah. That's a tough way to have a lesson. Wow, yeah, that's harsh. Yeah. So I, this is something I'm sure people are going to be most interested in more than anything else, is how, since you would probably agree, everybody has some ability, even if it's mm-hmm. minuscule. Some people have more than others. Some people may be more teachable than others. Some people may have some moderate amount of natural talent, but with some good training, it can really come out and maybe do something really useful in their lives. Do you have any kind of academy or certification or anything you do with really, you know, helping people uh, at least get on the path to doing what you do? Well, I'll tell you, I'm very fussy because there's a lot of people claiming to be um, able to do all sorts of... um, uh, the problem with this industry, let me just back it up, is that anybody can hang a shingle up, but not everybody really has the ability. There's a, it's very unregulated. You know, everybody can draw a stick figure. Not everybody is a da Vinci. And, you know, with my type of work, I'm very specific. Names, numbers, dates, and times, past, present, and future. And I get weird names, too. And I won't say, oh, you know, you're connected to a John. I'll say, Howard's your brother, or whatever. Um, 
when I've taught classes before, I actually allow people into my class, I do pre-screening. The problem with the industry is everybody wants to make money, I hate to say this, and there are a lot of people that will just take everybody and anybody, and I don't think that's really healthy, because you may be taking people that really... Um, giving people false hope that they could maybe yeah. do something they'll never really be able to do. Or... or they could be dangerous, because there's people out there that say dangerous things. So, you know, for the integrity of this industry, um, as far as um, that's concerned, and, and just basic ethics... You know, there's nothing worse than having a bad product go out there because it reflects poorly on all of us. And it is true, we all do have a little bit of ability, but again, you know, like I tell people, everybody can draw stick figures, but not everybody's a da Vinci, you know. Everybody has talent, but not everybody's gifted, you know. And we all have our gifts, you know, everybody has, you know, their gifts, and it's using it for the right reason. It's all about intention. Is there any criteria that a person could use to determine if it's worthwhile pursuing some uh, training in this field? Um, yes, you know, if they get a lot of visions that they, they don't understand or they're curious about it, you know, slowly, you know, start reading up on it and see where you fit in. Um, you know, that's probably a good stepping stone. Um, you know, you can talk to different people, look at people that may, um, you know, talk to other psychics, legitimate psychics, people that, you know, you um, have received good information about that have good reputations and maybe talk to them a little bit to see what their thoughts are. Um, but again, you know, a lot of people want to be psychics nowadays, and there's no regulation. So everybody, and, and most people do have some psychic abilities. Not that we don't, but you know, there's a difference between, you know, a mathematician and somebody that can do, you know, basic accounting. So if, if somebody does indicate to you through maybe a questionnaire, interview process, or whatever, they they do have, you know, some potential, and they would like to do some study with you. How do the mechanics of that work? Uh, is it like just a one-on-one thing, or do you do I usually do classes? classes or... Yeah, and it's good because you want people to play off of each other. You know, you give them different um, projects and, and so on and so forth. But I do like a pre-screening to make sure. I mean, uh, the last class I did, and it's been a while, we had like 40 people, and I only took 10 because mm-hmm. I'm not going to bring people in for whatever reason if they don't have the core values or they don't have, um, you know, the raw talent um, or if there's some sort of nutcase, you know, you just, you got to be careful too, because you never know what's going to come out of it. Because when you're doing this type of work and you really start doing deep work, uh, a lot of things can come to the surface, you okay. know, and if you don't have your own psychological, you, if you can't manage your own emotions, then this isn't always a place to be, because if you can't manage your emotions, how are you going to help somebody else? Yeah, it seems yeah. like, you know, you could Dangerous. only make it more so, you know, if you're on the edge somehow. You know, so it seems like... You know, somebody who's got some problems and got some talent, that would be a very bad combination. Right. One could make the other worse, it would, it would seem, maybe. I don't know. It's like I tell everybody, you know, Jack the Ripper probably had a lot of friends. You just wouldn't want him to have them over dinner, you know, for dinner, so. <laughs> <laughs> Let alone give them Ginsu knives just as a sidebar. <laughs> no I, oh, well, there's one other thing. When we were talking about time, and you were talking about getting into a meditative state, there's a lot of people out there, if you talk to them privately, they'll talk a lot about plant medicines. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, you know, are concerned about legal ramifications, that may be what they want to admit publicly versus tools that they might be using responsibly with themselves or maybe, you know, you know, group, you know, ayahuasca ceremony or something like that, or more mushrooms. Do, do those kind of things figure into your work at all, or do you find them to be at all useful to even consider for this type of thing? You know, I'm open-minded. I'm, you know, all about natural remedies if they do work um i don't do a ton of it i believe in supplementation um so i don't really use those i don't do um smudging because i'm a sensitive so for me i get migraines real easy and it bothers my asthma that's why i laugh when people used to say i'll put a candle on no don't do me any favors (laughs) thank you i'm a sensitive for a reason you know sinusy but you know i do believe that there are effective you know homeopathic remedies and things along that line and sure you know if it works for you why not um i don't technically work with them. I make uh, recommendations, check this, try that, or whatever. Is there anything else you could think of that you would like to let our listeners know about before we wrap up? You've got a wonderful show. Okay. But you don't have to be psychic. Just watch. All right. (laughs) Thank you very much. Oh, Karen, thank you for uh, your generosity of time. Uh, This is uh, Rob and Debbie Dashinger uh, with the Dare to Dream podcast. We are here at the Conscious Life Expo. Signing off. Bye. To contact the award-winning, syndicated Dare to Dream radio show, go to DebbieDashinger.com. Keep your excellent feedback and comments coming. 
Your host, Debbie Dashinger, is an expert at goal achievement, a media personality, an international best-selling author, and a keynote speaker. Debbie leads high-quality teleseminars on how to achieve goals, how to be a self-published best-selling author, and how to get booked on radio. All classes are at DebbieDashinger.com. Debbie's best-selling books are Dare to Dream, This Life Counts, sold on Amazon, and her second book, Wisdom to Success, The Secrets to Accomplish All Your Dreams, sold online at all bookstores. Tune in again to hear the next inspiring interview guest who has turned their vision into a successful reality. Want more support in making your dreams come true? Go to DebbieDashinger.com. That's www.debibidashinger.com. You'll see videos, MP3s, archived interviews, and amazing products sharing the secret steps to making your dreams come true. Remember to dream big with every expectation that your dream will become real. Dreams are free, so free your dreams. What do you dare to dream? Here I'm standing now, waiting for my time to be all that I can be. To forget, life is in my hands, and I can change it if I want. Nothing's impossible no more. If you only did, if you dare to dream, if you just believe. What books are you reading? Are you ready for a must-read? Winner of the Inspirational Book of the Year Award and international bestsellers, Dare to Dream, This Life Counts by Debbie Dashinger, as well as the acclaimed Wisdom to Success, The Surefire Secrets to Accomplish All Your Dreams. Buy the books from Amazon today. U.S. Book Review and Writer's Digest said these are critics' picks by Debbie Dashinger, Dare to Dream, and Wisdom to Success contain gems to live your life by. What would you say if I told you that you could change your life in only one hour and all while lying down relaxing? Thousands of people all over the world have. What am I talking about? It's called Access Consciousness The Bars. The Bars is an energetic body process that contains 32 different points on your head that when run assist you in releasing decisions about any area of your life that you have made solid and as a result cannot change. The Bars is the first class in Access Consciousness a dynamic set of tools and information designed to transform any area of your life. When you have a bar session, the worst that can happen is you feel like you had a fantastic massage. The best thing that can happen is your whole life could change. Go to accessconsciousness.com today to find a facilitator to schedule a private session or to find a bars class in your area. Are you willing to give yourself an hour to change your life? 